but you can't just fall in love with the technology, right? It, it has to work in the real world and survive. And so this is where getting that broad input sooner rather than later. And, and of course, you have to listen to it, right? You have to actually <laughs> not just to give it lip service, but uh, you know, make changes to accommodate when you get that feedback. Welcome to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Cam, a podcast for industry professionals who are transforming the industry using digital. I'm Jeffrey, and in this show, we look at various digital innovations that help lower costs, improve productivity, and reduce emissions. If you want to discuss this show further or just stay in touch, you can contact me on Twitter at Jeffrey Can or at JeffreyCan.com. In this episode, I'm in conversation with Lenny Shaver, who is the Director of Strategic Marketing at Advanced Energy. Larry works in critical sensing and control products, which is a fancy way of saying sensor technology. Sensor tech, which is what really enables the Internet of Things, uh, is rapidly evolving. Optical sensors in particular are finding more and more powerful uses in oil and gas. And we'll talk specifically about flaring as just one example. Here's Lenny. Lenny, welcome to Digital Oil and Gas. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. No, as a, as a, in the lead off, I've uh, mentioned that this conversation is going to be on uh, sensor technology and how that's evolving. So that's where we're going to uh, go. But let's begin first, though, Lenny, with a bit of your background. I'm curious to know where you uh, career started and how you found yourself now working at this very interesting area of, of, of the sensor world. Yes. Well, I've been in the sensor world for more than 25 years now, and uh, I would say sort of stumbled into it. I um, I started my life as a mechanical engineer, hmm. and uh, so that's what I did initially. Also had a couple other engineering degrees and uh, started working for a company making optical sensors. This was a long time ago, and uh, through uh, many acquisitions and growth and lots of work, uh, 25 years later, I'm still doing sensors and uh, kind of inspired by it. It's been an interesting sort of nexus in, in the, the world, both in markets and technology. So it's, uh, it's really driven me to uh, stay in this space. What's the, what's the, if someone am asking, what's the connection between optical sensor and your mechanical background? Is there a, is there like, or was it, was it a shift, a, a sort of a no, engineering technical it, shift? It's a good question. I mean, so basically all optical systems have some sort of optical mechanical interface, right? So when you're oh. designing optical sensors, sometimes it's designing the optics themselves and how you package them, how you integrate mm -hmm. them. Other times it's how to install an optical system into uh, an application. And uh, in our case, it's it's kind of both those. So that's that's where I started. And then we don't only do optical sensors at this company. Mm -hmm. um, and my career isn't only optical sensors, but primarily it has been. And optics, you know, they're fun. They're kind of high tech. But optics also have an advantage that in a lot of harsh industry, like in the oil and gas industry, mm -hmm. it can interface with the process in a, in a reliable way, right? It doesn't – it's not stuck into the system or the process. It doesn't degrade. It doesn't corrode. Um, so this is where optics have, uh, um, have a place in industry, but they also have a place in lots of other interesting places, medical – um, and so it's, it's been my area of, of yeah, devotion, of, of I guess. Devotion, yeah. Your life's, your life's work. Yeah. <laughs> get, get your arms yeah, around yeah. this. Yeah. And I don't think light is susceptible to electrical interference. That may be That's another right. uh, feature of them that makes them quite useful in harsh environments because they're. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's immune to electromagnetic. This mm -hmm. also means high voltage, so it's safe and high voltage. So it has a safety, can kind of go almost anywhere. And it's reliable. It doesn't degrade. It doesn't corrode. It doesn't uh, doesn't drift. Yeah. Um, so those are all the. Of course, it's not perfect, right? It you do have to um, install it into the system, and then yeah. in some cases, usually not in the oil and gas space, but it, you know, it can be interrupted by other light. Like it can be confused by other light. So it depends on the um, the application, how we handle that, or how that if you know if that invalidates the use of optics or not. But that's a an challenge it's yeah. always worked on with optics yeah a little consideration to be thinking about yeah now the uh, there's a whole range of um very interesting business challenges associated with the sensor rule let me just throw a, f a couple out here and because what i want to do is explore this a little bit uh power like how do you power these things like they got into a remote site 
How do you deal with things like cyber concerns? How do you make them rugged? That sort of stuff. So maybe uh, maybe what you can do is uh, help help unpack a little bit here. What, what are the kinds of problems and challenges that the sensor the sen- your world sensor world? What are the problems of, that you're working hard to overcome that uh, that are are, are you know in, in, instrumental to the success of the world of digital as we embrace um, sensor technology more and more? Right. Well, so it it does depend on the sensor, but let's address a few of those. So Mm. um, one for power, this is kind of an interesting one. So there's sometimes sensors have uh, different um, methods of optics. So just once you're measuring temperature optically, this is one we do a lot in industry. Um, So you do have to power the electronics. So it's a relatively low power system, but you do it when you install it in the field, you do have to navigate or uh, route power to it. And communications to get that signal back so Uh, in that way it's like a normal sensor yeah um and so there has to be thoughtful ways that you do that so that when it's deployed and installed it's reliable um other sensors are are sort of neat in that if it's a fiber optic sensor that you're routing through a system at one point you have to send light into it but the sensor itself is completely non-powered in the the optical sense. so the fiber itself doesn't have any power in it. it has light in it but it's sort of immune and uh, you know, there's no batteries. So there's power at one end, so there's still mm-hmm. some power to be considered. Um, but it's uh, the actual sensing element is completely non-electrical. Uh, so that makes it very safe. Uh, you know, those would be installed on like pipelines or sometimes for some detection techniques. They're also used in security. You know, it's like the White House is totally secured by these fiber optic <laughs> sensors. Already. That makes sense, yes. Can't can't uh, hack into it unless you kind of snip into it, I suppose. Right, and yeah. you snip into it, it'll be detected immediately. Exactly, so it, yeah. it, It'll know that. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, <laughs> a little bit off tangent, but that's uh, another area. But still quite, place. still germane though. If you think about oil and gas infrastructure, you know, we now have just in the past, uh, past uh, two to three weeks, uh, the sabotage of the subsea pipeline. Right. Uh, the North Sea pipeline. The North sea pipeline. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the world's now on a notice that um, the pe- people are now motivated for whatever reason to go and sabotage industrial infrastructure. How do you know and when? Is it, you know, in the case of Sweden, it was there's a seismic event, but you could imagine if you had actually severed a uh, optical cable, boom, you'd have instant knowledge that something's gone sideways. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And uh, um, unfortunately, yeah, the world we live in now, <laughs> especially for, you know, and I mean, it started at 9-11, right? I think all yep. of us uh, in the, have been, in, unfortunately, in the career that long. Remember then, you know, there was sort of an uptick in security, also cyber things, yep. cyber robustness. Um, but it's, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it continues. It continues, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, back to sensors. So we have, uh, so we talked a little bit of power, power and communications is another angle. Um, ruggedness and sort of the imperative to make them quite rugged for so they can work in a variety of environments. Uh, what about the, uh, the these general architecture of these sensors? I think is challenging for 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 organizations because if you if you don't think about that carefully. You, you can find yourself having to create the same layer over and over again, depending on the sensor structure. How does how do, how does the world of sensors deal with that challenge? It is a challenge, and and there's a couple of different ways it's dealt with. Uh, generally, it's also an area where there's lots of opportunity to uh, get more from the sensor data. So. Um, in some cases, the sensors can be somewhat simple, where they have a simple interface that plugs into sort of the existing infrastructure in the the plant operation. So most plants have a large scale, you know, DCS distributed control system. Yep. And Scale so the plant. Yeah. Existing yeah. Um, uh, plugins to those interfaces. So sometimes, and this is actually something I think when when you're considering employing a new technology. It's important to have that discussion up front with the, it depends on the organization who the right people are, right? But it's important to get mm-hmm. those stakeholders who kind of manage the data. And and I've seen customers go different directions on this. So sometimes, um, you know, they really want to employ a new technology quickly into that, their, their standard data architecture. Um, and other times, sometimes they want to experiment with a new technology and not yet invoke. Sometimes it, it spools up a whole bunch of um, concerns or efforts or maybe cost to integrate into this system. So sometimes they want to set up a separate, uh, you know, data lake, separate little spot to employ new technology. And then they can decide at a later date how to integrate it into the, uh, the the general operations, if you will. But 
I, I would break it up that, that point aside into two kind of general areas. One is just um, making use of the data inputs already at the plant and trying to fit into that. So there's protocols that are typically standard for, you know, a big system out there is uh, from OSI, uh, the so-called PI system, yep. which kind of runs a lot of these plants. So a lot of sensors, you know, we have ways to get the data directly into the PI system. Yeah, exactly. Just plug right, right in. Plug right in. Yep. Um, and other times, especially more complicated data, especially like visual data um, and, and other things, this is actually where there's an area for really potential for machine learning and other aspects that uh, this actually sometimes get proprietary. There's some things under NDA that I can't speak openly about, <laughs> but there's a lot of uh, a lot of potential there in the industry to get more from this data. And so there's big companies in this space. So we're all, our view as a primarily a sensor company, mm. um, and we do have some algorithms, but we're sort of agnostic. We want to work with everyone and uh, basically get the data out there so people can uh, can interpret it. Yeah, make it accessible. To what degree is the, uh, the right now? The world is is still wrestling with uh, the, um, the aftermath of the pandemic and the uh, sharp swing back in in economic activity, which has resulted in shortages of chips and other critical technologies. How are these impacting the the world of uh, the sensor provider? Like are these are these getting in the way at the moment and. Uh, or, or is this a you know that's fine for Ford and automo automakers, but not really affecting our industrial world? No, it does affect the industrial world. I mean, we are we've managed it pretty well as an organization, but I would say broadly, it is infecting, infecting, affecting, and, and infecting. And to both, the, yes. Yeah, um, it, it's it's generally slowed things down a lot. So I think companies, I think everyone feels this, but you have to plan a little bit longer for everything right so when we're deploying things ordering you know even simple things uh such as machine parts uh you know not as fancy as the you know the microprocessors and chips but sensors do make use of microprocessors and chips and uh even simple little you know converter chips and not very you know sophisticated microprocessors those have gotten if they're available they're more expensive so th this inflation and you know everyone's talking just today about what the Fed's going to do to raise rates and continue that, yeah. um, but it it is infecting in the way of prices are increasing, lead times are increasing, and I hope it relaxes a bit. And I, I th our what we're seeing in the supply chain is a little bit of improvement. We've definitely seen that it wasn't as bad as maybe um, earlier in the year, and we expect 2023 to. Uh, improve further. So it's it's relaxing and getting better. Well, as the world uh, slips into recession, which is widely forecasted, uh, we should see a slowdown and, and then some some things will suddenly go into over um, excess supply because there isn't the, uh, the, the demand, particularly these, these controllers go into consumer goods, which may, may have a, uh, re a more serious uh, reduction in demand. Yeah. And it's interesting too to see the investments. Um, we're seeing this, um, you know, I saw one, I think just yesterday, it's a little bit tangent, but Nucor, a big steel company, announcing a big investment here in the U.S. Mm. So there is this, especially in the U.S., this onshoring. Uh, it's happening Phenomenal. in Europe a bit as well. Yep. And, you know, these things take a long time, but it's happening all across the supply chain. So, yeah, um, yeah just as, you know, the, 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 the competing trends here will be, you know, slow down in the economy, but also these investments to beef up the supply chain. So uh, it'll, I'm sure there'll be some pains in spots. Um, because these things take time. Um, but I'm actually encouraged by, especially in North America, you know, the investments that are happening here. It's it's kind of exciting. There's a lot happening. Yeah, the, the Inflation Reduction Act is just one example, is going to unlock an enormous uh, opportunity wave. Uh, it's, it's very dramatic. Some, uh, some, some are, are quite concerned about it. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm the optimist. <laughs> I look at that as a a huge opportunity to for those who are interested in investing in new areas of the economy. This is uh, they now have a really interesting tax incentives to get on with it. So it could be could be very exciting. Um, now, when you sit down with uh, in industrialists who are uh, um, at a at a plant setting and and they're they're interested in new, new sensor capabilities, uh, what are the kinds of use cases or examples that you share with them to illustrate just how powerful these 
uh, tools and technologies now are. are There's some some ready examples you can share. Maybe not don't have to name names at all, but uh, certainly uh, just to illustrate the impact. Yes, um, I, I have a lot to share. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a, just a few, yeah. um, and we can kind of see where we want to dig in deeper. But at a high level, there's sort of two general areas that sensors help. Uh, one is a little simpler, but it's just safety. And uh, but it's important. There's a lot of you know we talked about security and so forth that the in this industrial environment. But there's a, you know these are dangerous places, and so when we can remove people and put in redundancy with sensors to you know it's not just safety. Sometimes it also helps with automation, right? So they can do more with less people. Um, so that is a whole category, and there's a lot of um, in some cases safety also means environmental controls, right? So sensors are quite important for, uh, you know, one area we work in is for different sensors that monitor flares. So there's both safety as well as environmental uh, concerns there. Mm -hmm. So that's one important area. A second important area is really just improving process control. That's, that's the one where the, the payback to the, uh, to the user is more significant. Uh, It doesn't mean it's more important, right? Because safety is hard to put a value on that. But um, where our sensors can help them operate more efficiently, get more, you know, whatever the product is, get more hydrogen, get more hydrocarbons uh, for the same input, that's an immediate payback. And that's a, another large area we discuss with customers. Yeah, they'd be very interested in that. If, if you could go, get, let's get really specific on safety. How, does this, how can you apply a sensor to improve a safety outcome? Uh, what 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 is the a a really good illustrative use case? Well, um, if we talk about flares, this is one. The flare is fundamentally the big safety system at a at a plant. So right as it, its role is, there's different types of flares, but of course one of the important flares is if anything goes wrong with the plant, you have to flare off yep. the uh, yes the product to make sure it's not uh, you know spewing accumulating out or spewing exactly yeah. Um, so it's absolutely critical to monitor these systems. Uh, to make sure they're ready to go. Um, So that's a fundamental safety. And the traditional way to do it is actually also a sensor to have a thermocouple monitoring all the pilot and control system. There's pilot lights just like at your home, on your stove almost, your heater. And um, if those those pilots, the thermocouples in those will absolutely fail. Everyone knows this. It's just sort of when they go under these extreme thermal cycles from use, they fail. And it's really hard to do maintenance on these player systems because they're a safety system. They plan maintenance like once every five years. If they can extend it longer, even better. And so what we provide is some optical sensors that can, from ground-based position, monitor those pilots safely, very reliably. And that acts as a, a secondary monitoring for when the thermocouples fail. So they can keep running with the flare system. Um, and even the optical systems give them additional information that they weren't getting from the Thermocouples, so you can actually see the flare, see how they're flaring, and there's other benefits as well. So uh, that's a really uh, a great example um, that, that I think people can get their head around because you can, in many of many cases, you point out we will all we have little flares in our homes, little pilot lights in the fireplace right. and the thermos. Yeah, I've got one in my my uh, front front uh, room, and uh, for me to know whether that thing's on or not, I got to. I got to tear the grid out, get down on my hands and knees, get a flashlight, remove all of the, you know, the fireplace equipment. Imagine doing that in an industrial context. Uh, it's, it's a huge amount of work and it's not it safe. Is. And, and on a flare stack, imagine, um, you know, these flare stacks are, you know, yeah. 100, 100 meters yep. or 200 meters high. Yeah. So when you have to do maintenance on those, you have to take, of course, the whole plant out of service that goes with that flare. And, uh, you know, it's not just replacing these components, but normally you need to bring in a rigging system or scaffolding. Yeah, or you exactly. Have to, I mean, you're not talking a thousand dollars. You're not talking, you're talking multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's big expenses. So anything you can do to like extend that uh, maintenance, mm-hmm. you can get another year if you can uh, um, reliably operate another method. So you can defer, you, you, you know, occasionally you have to do maintenance, of course, yep. but this is it gives you as an operation it gives you some flexibility when you do that work 
uh, and still maintain safety standards. Now, you mentioned there's other data that the optical sensor can secure that a traditional um, uh, traditional uh, sensors cannot. What, what can you just uh, what, what what exactly you're talking about there? Are you yeah. actually interpreting what the flame looks like? Is exactly right. So um, there's a project we're working on. Working on a project. So we're working on a project right now in the Middle East. So we're combining our sensors to uh, actually monitor the smoke from the flare. And mm. so that smoke, no one wants to see smoke from their flare. There's nope. a couple things about it. <laughs> one is it means you're not combusting it correctly, you're not burning it off appropriately. Um, depends if you're anywhere around people. Also, you, you, you don't want to get your neighbors upset at you. Exactly. They don't like to see the flare in general, but it's worse when it's smoking and that particulate's coming off. So the optical sensors can not just see the pilot, but then when it's burning, interpret the quality of that flame and feed that back uh, so that the, there's adjustments the operations can make to attune either steam assist or gas assist to get the right balance to get m more complete combustion of the flare system. Yeah, that's really um, a, a great example um, uh, as uh, to how this can improve things. But it raises yet another question, which is there is a, a thread of data that comes off of uh, sensors when they get they start to become this rich in in the data points that they're able to collect. Uh, so, so is it, how is how is the industry addressing or need to address this this data explosion that comes along with the addition of new sensors? Yes, it's an, it's definitely the case. It's it's definitely a challenge. Um, so there's I think multiple ways. I think the industry is still trying to figure out how to do that in, in the best way. Um, it's similar to what we talked about earlier. For us as a company, what we try to do is provide flexibility to our users and, and customers how they want to get the data. So we we've provided some data services ourselves, kind of a, um, a really a software as a service, like our own cloud service. Of course, yeah. Where we've stored some data. Mm -hmm. um, there's depends on the industry and client. There's sometimes cybersecurity concerns about that, and yes. and you know some. If you set up the right firewalls, the right um, infrastructure, that's accepted. Other cases, we provide sort of on-premise data storage for our clients or let them work with their IT groups for them to do it themselves and just kind of um, package our data so it's easy for them to put into their data systems. Now, of course, if you've plugged the sensors into the um, a Pi environment that's already there, then you'll be relying on the historian to really manage that data. But if the historian isn't sophisticated enough to handle, say, visual data, so th that's where the problem starts to arise. How do you handle that? And this is sort of the question. Right. So th that is exactly the case where we've provided our own data historian yeah. for customers sort of complements like the Pi system. Mm -hmm. So Pi is really looking for, you know, value at time. Yeah. You know, yep. voltage, time series temperature, data. pressure yep. Yep. At, at every second, for example. So when we distill the data down, we can do that. Um, but when we want to look at visual data and do more machine learning on it, then really um, that is where we provide our own software packages to help them. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some cases, work with other third parties. What is industry's reaction when you um, uh, discuss with them the, the power of these sensors? Uh, are they open? Are they closed-minded? Are they dismissive? Are they suspicious? What is the, what is yeah. the general stance? So, uh, there's I mean, generally, they're very positive, but it does depend on the audience. And so that's one thing I enjoy talking with the different – and I think that's really important to talk to all the different – you know, stakeholders. The, the, the yeah. buzzword would be stakeholders, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you know, you have the the engineers are always quite keen to adopt the new technology, um, and I'd say the group that's sometimes hesitant is more the operations. And I think mm -hmm. the operations groups always, you know, had the experience that they've had numerous technologies implemented over the years, and uh, with with just being extra work for them to do maintenance on, but not seeing the value. All right. So. Um, that is something that actually is the most exciting to get their feedback when, when we do deploy this, because that's one thing that we, and I think anyone succeeding in this space, they have to do. They have to really think about the design of these things for the real world, you know, how it's going to day in, day out survive, not be a, uh, a maintenance nightmare <laughs> for the operations crew. And, and uh, that's why it's the most satisfying. You get that feedback from the ops crew that, that they love it, that they, in the case of like an imaging system where they have the images, you know, in the control room, it's just there and they, 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 they 
they depend on it. They just look at it every day and, you know, they become your biggest fans. Yeah. Once, they, once you build it and show the value to them directly, you know, then they, you can actually see how they, they, they adapt and flex their day because they can create uh, time to do other things they've never been able to get to because the sensor is giving them that uh, kind of that kind of flexibility. Now, let's let's turn to the untapped potential question here because uh, – uh, the the uh, I mean the, the the lot of oil and gas infrastructure out there, power infrastructure too. We're now adding uh, tremendous levels now of renewable technologies. This is a wave of hydrogens coming at us. Uh, there there will likely be an expansion of liquefied natural gas exports. Uh, this suggests to me <laughs> that we should see a a considerable upgrowth here, uh, expansion potential. What is, what is your sense? Like, what what is this the opportunity here that 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 is uh, awaiting uh, as we uh, deal with energy expansion? Yeah, there is a lot of uh, excitement, I think, in the space about the expansion and uh, for sensing as well as as learning how to manage this. Uh, I think a big area that we're working on and it's but it's it requires the whole industry to kind of focus on it is and maybe we mentioned earlier, but is machine learning. You know, as you um, deploy, let's take uh, just one example you mentioned. Let's talk about battery systems, for example. So there's going to be more battery systems at a you know utility scale. Uh, everywhere, someplace we're supporting plants, uh, other supporting just the grid, right? The normal grid for all these EV cars and and all the uh, yep. renewable energy that's coming out. So the renewable energy, storing that energy for use when the wind isn't blowing. And and for these, you know, the health of battery systems or the health of any of these systems, there are very common systems, but we don't quite know how they operate in the real world. And if we're collecting that data. And then as events occur, you know, using machine learning to find the early indicators of failure points or the early indicators of, uh, you know, drift in a system. Um, this is a huge area where sensors combined with data and machine learning is a uh, tremendous potential. And uh, really all the things you mentioned, almost every segment has uh, a, p- a potential there. Yeah. Um, I know also in, in, in the liquefied natural gas, that is another big area which is expanding. Uh, there's going to – that one's one where there's a lot of safety concerns as well <clears throat> as you're moving that from shore to offshore. So this is one where we've seen a lot of sensor inquiries actually quite recently uh, with that expansion on the East Coast, uh, which is expected here in the U.S. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very real. And Germany is building five uh, import facilities intended to be operational by the end of next year to cope with uh, gas challenges in Europe. And uh, so the, the the demand is clearly there. Not, it might, might not be driven um, in, in entirely the right way. A war in Europe isn't the, the it's, it's not the basis around which you want to build your business. But uh, but the, but the other expansion, the the potential, uh, I think, is genuine and very very real. Um, can you share any lessons you've taken from your experience with helping organizations address the application of this technology in their landscapes? Like what 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 advice do you give them when you know you sort of engaging with them in the in the first conversations? I think it's something we maybe touched a bit on already, but it is about getting the broad view from all the different people who use the technology in as early as possible. Mm. Um, you know, even uh, the groups that you maybe think uh, don't have influence. We talked about, you know, the operations people who have to do the maintenance, but there's the IT group, the data. So getting that input in as soon as possible, um, you know, just a, a simple example. There's sometimes the simplest things you learn uh, I know for one of our products, it's very well protected to survive in the environment. So it's got a lot of stainless steel and big parts and mounts so forth. And as we worked with the the installation team, they were like, well, you know, this is just heavy. <laughs> it, it, it's a simple thing, right? And so we had to break down the product into more subcomponents for installation. You know, you get over a certain weight, it, it invokes different worker rules. And it invokes, uh, you know, different permitting to breathe it out. And you know, these are simple things, but it's it's easy to mitigate if you have that input sooner um, so we could modularize modularize our equipment <laughs> to make it easy to install. Um, so that's just a simple example, but I, I think, you know, it's it's easy for, especially me, I, I come as an engineer and I'm in strategic marketing. I'm all excited about the future and new stuff. 
and that is great. You need that sort of passion to kind of drive steps forward. Um, but you can't just fall in love with the technology, right? It, it has to work in the real world and survive. And so this is where getting that broad input sooner rather than later. And, and of course, you have to listen to it right you have to actually <laughs> not just to give it lip service but uh you know make changes to accommodate when you get that feedback yeah so that's a great lesson and yeah, very useful um important for all entrepreneurs out there who might be listening to this which is uh, uh the the voice of the stakeholder consumer customer user end user across the full gamut of uh, these large organizations actually is, listen to it all because it will have a, it will have a flavor even down to the weight. <laughs> she says the weight of things. So yeah. I, yeah. It's, no. it's sometimes the simple things. Uh, I mean, you know, and, and when I talk about the simple thing, of course, sometimes we find something new though. You do need to find that champion at the site who really uh, is willing to stick their neck out a little bit, right. And try something new or get it approved. Right. There's always an inherent risk averse. Don't want to change. In, in any organization, especially big organizations. So you sort of need, that's the other end of it. You, you, uh, you need to find someone who's really identified the pain point and, and wants to make a difference. And maybe, you know, maybe it's a career move for them, who knows, or it's something they want to make their mark. Um, but, uh, or, or they had some other painful experience, right, with, <laughs> with something existing. Yeah. Um, so there always has to be that as well to kind of help drive change. Uh, Lenny, this has been a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. It was my pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you. That was Lenny Shaver, Director of Strategic Marketing at Advanced Energy, in conversation about sensor technologies and their role in improving the performance of energy infrastructure. I particularly appreciated Lenny's point about engaging with all the possible audiences for some innovation, particularly operations, and how simple things like just the weight of a housing can become a barrier to adoption. Thanks for listening to the Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. This podcast can be found everywhere podcasts are available, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find all the resources and links mentioned in the episode in the show notes, and you can listen to the previous episodes at jeffreycan.com. If you have a moment, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes as it helps others find the show, along with other great content. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. The podcast returns in a week with another episode, so stay tuned.